Okay, hello everybody. Uh, can you all hear me? Is it this mic now, Andrew? All right. Hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the final ever, well until next year anyway, uh, session of parametric engineering. Um, so this week uh, we're going to cover uh, two very, very broad topics in not a lot of detail. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, how things operate a bit more in the real world, how you can deal with the limitations um, that Grasshopper and Rhino have in their kind of default state. Um, so we're going to be talking about two things. Uh, first of all, how you go about integrating Rhino and Grasshopper into uh, a kind of a, an engineering workflow, how you can build it in with the rest of your uh, systems. Um, and then secondly, we're going to be looking at how you can extend Grasshopper and Rhino um, in order to provide extra functionality that isn't already um, in the box. Uh, so the first thing of that is, is how do you actually use Rhino and Grasshopper as part of an overall engineering workflow? Um, and this is a little bit more difficult for us as uh, structural engineers um, than it is for uh, architects, perhaps, um, because architects are mainly dealing with, with purely geometry. Uh, whereas, which, which Rhino and Grasshopper do very well, um, but engineers require slightly more complex data. Um, so we need to be able to um, set up analysis models, and as part of those analysis models, there's a lot more data involved than just purely uh, the geometric. So we also need to worry about materials and loads and all these kind of things. Um, so... Vlad showed you last week uh, Karamba, which allows you to um, set up finite element models inside uh, Grasshopper. Um, and that's great for kind of doing rapid exploration at early stages. Um, but as projects go on, you tend not to be able to actually use Karamba to really justify your design decisions. You have to actually analyze it in uh, an external package, which, uh, depending on where you are in the world, uh, the authorities will actually recognize. Um, so that means you need to take data out of Rhino and Grasshopper um, and put it into something else, put it into some other kind of analysis package, uh, ultimately put it into some kind of package for documentation, so put it into a BIM package like Revit. Um, and this is a bit trickier for us as structural engineers than it is for architects, probably. I'm not an architect, so you'll have to take my word on that. Um, so... Uh, the good news is it's a problem that's been around for a long time uh, and I myself have done a fair amount of work in trying to help out with that. Um, so I'm going to talk through some case studies of uh, projects I worked on in the past um, and how uh, Grasshopper and Rhino have formed part of that um, process. Um, and linking into what we're talking about later, uh, a lot of this has involved um, a bit of custom software development in order to extend uh, Rhino and Grasshopper uh, to meet those criteria. So, first up uh, is this project, uh, the ArcelorMittal Orbit. Uh, big, ugly red thing you might have seen in the Olympic Park in Stratford. Um, so this, this is something I worked on a long, long time ago, um, back in, in the sort of early days of, of Grasshopper. Um, but this was kind of one of the, the first projects, I think, where Rhino and Grasshopper were really an integral part of how um, that whole project came together. Uh, and in particular, it was a very useful way of being able to collaborate um, and being able to communicate with the artist, Anish Kapoor, um, and be able to respond quickly uh, to make changes that, that he would like to see. So the way that the geometry of this project is generated, it's fairly complex geometry uh, from a visual point of view at least, um, but actually really the whole benefit of computational design and, and, um, and parametric design is being able to take these complex geometries and rationalize them down into a form that's actually easy for us to control um, by exploring, by exploring the, uh, the complexity in the form of an algorithm. Um, so, in this case, the basic control geometry, uh, the thing that actually controls the shape uh, of this sculpture, um, was simply 
um, a couple of splines uh, in 3D space. And these set out the center lines um, of these big diagrid tubes that go to form the sculpture. Um, so that was defined in Rhino. Uh, we originally actually had a script that was generating those based on um, a kind of a gravity field that these particles are flowing through, but uh, in the end we actually rationalized that down to just a spline that we could control. Uh, in Grasshopper, um, we were then generating the rest of that diagrid based on that spline. So there were a couple of parameters here. There was just the spline itself, um, and then there were a couple of radius values determining how um, wide or small um, that tube was getting at different points. Um, and then the number of subdivisions to turn that into a diagrid. Um, but the actual definition here isn't actually super complicated. Probably all of you now having done this course could model something very much like this. Um, what we then did, in order to make that geometry useful to us, uh, is to use a bit of software that I developed uh, called Salamander. Um, and we're going to be using Salamander in a minute. Um, but what we were using it for here was essentially to take that centerline geometry and apply the structural properties to it, so the section properties, the materials, the loads, and so on, which would allow us to analyze that. Um, and then through Salamander, we exported a GSA model, uh, which gave us our analysis model. So we could then rapidly, based on small tweaks to this, export a new analysis model, look at it. We could say to the artist, it would be better, actually, if you tweak this over here slightly, and, and we connected that up there. Um, and we could then, in collaboration with the artist, make changes to this form um, that would mean that it achieved the effect that he wanted, which was of a kind of an unstable tower, uh, and the effect that we wanted, which was uh, a stable tower. Um, so by going through this loop, we were able then to, to work with him very closely. And also, we could output uh, this uh, structural geometry, uh, in this case via Tecla, um, in a form that then the fabricators could use that information as well. So we're exporting a Tecla model, um, which the fabricators were then taking um, and uh, using in order to fabricate uh, the various bits of steelwork that went in to form this sculpture. Um, so that was kind of one of the earliest uh, points when I personally did this, about, I don't know, it's about 10 years ago now, um, or about eight years. Um, but it's something that kind of throughout my career I've been doing more and more and refining more and more. Um, so this is another project uh, which I did uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a tennis stadium in Qatar. Uh, it's not actually built yet. Uh, may or may not ever be built. We'll find out. Um, and this was again a fairly complex geometry but it was based around certain rules that we could use in order to build up a parametric model. Um, so the structure of this roof, so we had a kind of a, a weird sort of bowl uh, geometry surrounding the seating bowl of the tennis stadium. Um, there was a moving roof on top of this, uh, and then there was a freeform wrapper geometry around the base. Um, and then underneath all this is a massive, massive car park, which fortunately I didn't have to worry about. I had some other people doing that. But, so I was worried about the steel structure on the top here. Um, so we could use Grasshopper to explore how we set out that structure. Um, and we came up with an arrangement uh, of uh, essentially reciprocal stars. Um, so we had a set of trusses which kind of crisscrossed over one another and supported one another. Um, we supported off the back of the bowl, uh, but formed in the center uh, a hole that we could then cover over. Um, and we explored different arrangements of this in a geometrical fashion, first of all. Uh, just to look at how we could interrelate um, the back of the bowl um, and this opening. Because the architects wanted to have an opening of ideally a certain size, but in order to fit the structure around that, um, we needed to actually set out these trusses in quite a uh, careful way. So that was, that was how we initially explored that. Uh, this then led on to a full structural model um, so all of the structural steel work was all defined uh, inside Grasshopper, uh, an output using Salamander. Um, and there's actually several different bits of this, uh, and all of these different things were actually interrelated. So um, we built a model of the main roof uh, as one model, 
uh, we had the retractable roof sitting on top, um, and we were taking the retractable roof uh, reactions, and then we were using that to apply loads on the main roof. Um, and we could then spit out from this process whenever we made it to change this geometry, which was fairly often, um, a structural model that we could analyze and look at, um, and a Revit model that we could then use for documenting um, and you know, sending to the client as part of our deliverables. Um, so by automating this process for a large part of this project, uh, I was dealing with all the different parts of steelwork in, in this roof, uh, essentially by myself which I don't recommend, um, but it is possible uh, through doing this to actually kind of do quite a lot of the work yourself and have quite a lot of control over the geometry. Um, so this is the overall workflow there. Um, every one of these boxes is a different file. Um, some of these are controlled by the architect, so these first three here are controlled by the architect. Um, but Basically, everything inside this dotted box here actually sat within Rhino and Grasshopper. So we had a single point of control, um, which was used to generate the different parts of this structure, um, and then output from that automatically, we had uh, the analysis models um, and the BIM models. Um, so this was a kind of a fully integrated workflow, which meant that we didn't have to do too much busy work rebuilding stuff in other packages, um, because we could just spit it out. Um, and deal with it there. Uh, so, uh, the current version of Salamander is called Salamander Free, because uh, it's the third time I've started rebuilding it. Um, and it's also called Salamander Free because it is now free to use. So the early versions of it were uh, back when I worked in Arup. Uh, they are still only available inside Arup, but uh, this new version, now that I've left Arup, uh, is actually free and available for anyone to use if they like, um, and it essentially sits uh, inside Rhino and Grasshopper, um, and it provides a means of data exchange out to structural analysis packages. Um, so at the moment, in the current version, uh, it's got support for Autodesk Robot, Oasis GSA, and eTabs, um, and I'm adding new uh, imports and exports as we go. Uh, so. Uh, in the first part of today, we're going to run through a, a short little example just setting up um, a model in Grasshopper using Salamander. Um, so first of all, you'll need to download and install Salamander, so we'll go through that first of all. Um, so if you've got a Food for Rhino account, then it is available on Food for Rhino, you can go there. Uh, if you don't have one and you don't want to sign up for one right now, uh, we've also saved a copy, actually a slightly more recent copy. Uh, at this link here. So if you go to this link, bit.ly forward slash design underscore salamander, um, and then download the zip file that you find there, um, and then we'll run through how you can actually install it, because um, it's a fairly good example of how you install plugins uh, if you haven't already been through that. So, once you've downloaded that zip file, uh, and shout out if you need me to put that link back up. Everyone got it already? Um, the first step, and it's quite an important step, uh, is that when you download stuff from uh, the internet that Windows doesn't recognize, Windows will very often block it, um, so you can't actually use it, which is not very helpful. Um, so I'm not sure whether it's done it in this case, but we can check. So if you get that, zip file, and you right click on it, and you go down to properties. Then if Windows has blocked it, you'll see this security message down the bottom. It says this file came from another computer, oh dear, uh, and might be blocked to help protect this computer. Um, so I'm a nice guy, you can trust me, there's nothing horrible in here, honest. Uh, so if you click unblock, that will uh, 
mean that we can actually run it, which is quite nice. Um, and then once you've done that, you can double click on that and then unzip it somewhere on your desktop. Um, so it's important to unblock it before you unzip it. Otherwise, you'll have to go through every single file in here and unblock it. Uh, and that's not a fun time for anyone. <coughs> um, so different plugins that you might download for uh, Rhino and or Grasshopper uh, work in slightly different ways. Um, but so some of them come with installers, some of them don't. Um, some of them need to be installed in special ways. Um, but at the heart of how the Grasshopper and, and Rhino plugin system works are these little files in here. So um, there's several, there's, well, there's a lot of files in this directory. The important ones, um, we can't see the uh, extensions here. Uh, let's see if I can add that. Do, do, do. Uh, on. Let's go properties. Let's see if I can modify this. No, I can't. Well, all right, you'll have to take my word for it what the extensions are. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, da, da, da. I've forgotten how to change this. Never mind. Um, so, uh, this salamander.rhino file is an RHP file. Um, so this is actually the main uh, type of plugin that you'll find uh, for Rhino. Um, a lot of plugins that you can install in Rhino are going to be these RHP files. Uh, and in this folder, we've actually got three of them. Um, so to install these inside Rhino, what you need to do is start up Rhino. And then you can simply drag and drop those files into um, Rhino. Um, and there's three different types uh, of these plugin files. Uh, so salamander.rhino is just a sort of a normal uh, Rhino plugin. Um, the salamander.rhino.import and salamander.rhino.export are import and export plugins, respectively. Um, and what they do is they add in extra file types to uh, the save load menus. Uh, so these are kind of optional, but uh, you might as well drag these in as well. Um, the other useful thing in here is this salamander.rhino. something else. I can't remember what the file extension is. RHI, I think. Uh, and this is a toolbar. Um, so if you drag that in as well, then you should see a new toolbar appears. Uh, in this case, because it was already installed, I've got an old toolbar, but I can just close that down. Um, and then the last thing that we have in this folder is this file here, which is a .gha file. So that's a grasshopper assembly, and that is a grasshopper plugin. Um, but again, you can install this in the same way. Uh, in fact, you may not even need to. It might install it automatically. We'll, let's find out. Uh, so yes, it looks like it's installed itself automatically. But in general, what you can do is drag and drop these things in as well. So if it hasn't already put a tab in here called Salamander Free, then you can drag and drop. Um, it will, if it already is installed, then it will pop up. Uh, saying, oh, you're trying to install something twice, what's going on? Um, so you can skip all in that case. Okay, so that is basically how you install plugins. Uh, sometimes when you download stuff from Food for Rhino or somewhere else, it will come with an installer. You don't need to do all this uh, mumbo jumbo. Uh, I haven't quite, quite got around to making one yet. Um, but this general approach will work for any uh, plugin. Um, one thing that's particular to uh, Salamander is that it's important 
uh, that you keep uh, all of the files in this folder together. Uh, so the basic tools GH uh, Grasshopper plugin needs to be in the same folder as the Salamander Rhino plugin because they kind of talk to each other and they need to know where uh, the other one is. Um, but other than that, everything should be installed, everything should be working fine. Uh, famous last words. Uh, so what does Salamander do? Um, it adds in a bunch of uh, structural modeling functionality to Rhino. So it essentially lets you model finite element models of the kind that you might know in FEA software um, inside Rhino um, and then export or import that data to a variety of different packages. Um, so uh, I'm mainly going to talk about the grasshopper side of things but just to demonstrate uh, you can actually use uh, Salamander just to draw stuff manually as well. Um, so I can, for example, click on this button here. And this will then boot Salamander up. Uh, and I can then draw out uh, a line. But this is a special type of line because this is a structural element. Um, and you should also have seen, as soon as you used any kind of uh, Salamander command, uh, this little sidebar over here pop up. Um, and this gives you access to more information about um, the structural elements that you create inside Rhino. Um, so if I select that line I just drew, because that's actually a special type of line that actually represents a linear element, when I select that, I'll get some options popping up over here. Um, and I can create a new section for that. Uh, I can specify the type of that section as a symmetric eye profile, for example. I can choose a catalog section for that. Oh, and because I'm in millimeters, it's got a very short beam uh, with a very big section on it. So you can use Salamander to draw out structural members with additional properties such as sections. Um, if I pick one of these nodes, then I can uh, restrain it in various ways and so on and so forth. So you can do all of this manually inside the tool, um, but uh, that's not what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus instead on how you do it uh, inside Grasshopper. Um, so. Salamander will kind of sit inside Rhino um, and it will create its own little layer system um, within uh, Rhino. Um, and you'll also see uh, this kind of tree view up here will get populated with different things. So if I click on the elements table, that gives me a table of all of the different elements in here. So it's a bit like GSA where you can, or robot or anything like that, where you can look at tables of the different items. It's that kind of functionality that Salamander brings to uh, Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, so, like I said, we're not going to bother doing too much manual modeling. Uh, so I'm just going to click on this button up here now to blank uh, everything I've done. So by clicking on that, I can actually just blank out that model and get rid of it. Um, and I'm going to start again uh, inside Grasshopper. Uh, so if I bring up Grasshopper, already there. Uh, so it feels self-indulgent enough as it is to be talking about this in the first place. Uh, so what we're going to do is just run through the most basic possible um, example here uh, so that you can get a feel for how you would set something up for export. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, looking at some other things. Um, so what we will set up here um, is uh, just a simple definition that will let us create a beam uh, of a particular length. Uh, we'll restrain the ends of that beam. Uh, we'll stick a UDL on it, a uniformly distributed load. If you're not already exposed to that kind of jargon. Um, and then we'll export that to GSA and analyze it. So we'll build a full analysis model here. Uh, I haven't actually checked if GSA is installed on here. Hopefully it is, otherwise that will be a bit of anticlimax. I guess we'll find out. Um, so, first of all, we'll just create a simple beam inside um, 
inside uh, Grasshopper. So first of all, we'll need to work out the geometry of that. Um, so actually, first things first. No, nope, I don't have it installed on here, or do I? No, nope, never mind. First things first, uh, we'll just create a couple of points. Um, and we'll specify the length of the beam by the distance between them. Um, so I'll pull down one of these construct point components. So this is under vector point. Uh, if you find one of those. Uh, so I think we've used these before, but basically what this lets you do is specify the x, y, and z coordinates of a point. Uh, so we've got one there. Uh, we'll leave that as it is. Uh, we'll then create a second one. So this is going to be the point that represents the start of our beam. Uh, second point will represent the end of our beam. And so that we can control the length of this beam, so we control the span very easily, uh, I will plug a slider into x here. Um, so because Salamander is dealing with uh, certain types of information that you don't normally deal with inside uh, Rhino and Grasshopper, there are a few things to bear in mind. Uh, one of those is that the units Rhino is in are now actually important. Um, so normally when you're dealing with Rhino and Grasshopper, uh, the units, which are down here, don't particularly matter all that much. Um, so you can flip between different units. Um, but in this case, when you define sections and so on, they are going to want to um, fit to uh, beam that you designed. So, uh, if you're working in millimetres here, then let's define a beam in millimetres. If you've got metres down here, then that's also fine. Um, but just uh, set the length of this beam uh, as a thousand times less than I'm about to specify now. Otherwise, you'll have a beam which is several thousand metres long, and we don't really want that. Uh, so uh, I'll set up a slider to control this. Um, let's start with a beam which is eight thousand millimeters long, otherwise known as eight meters. Uh, so again there I was just using the shortcut where you double click and type in a number. Uh, let's rename this to beam length and plug that into X. Right, and then let's zoom out till we can see it. Now we've got a second point somewhere to the right uh, of the first one, uh, and we can control how far away that actually is. <coughs> uh, second step is the same thing we've done about a billion times before now. Uh, we're just going to create a line between those two points. So we'll use a good old line component from curve primitive. We'll plug one point into A and another point into B. So far, so hopefully familiar. Um, so that defines the geometry. Um, in this case, it's just a sim sim single, simple beam. Um, but everything I'm going to show you from now on applies no matter how many elements you've got. Uh, whatever your geometry is, uh, it's basically the same process. Um, so you could have you know, some horrendously complicated sculpture like the Arsenal Metal Orbit uh, coming in here. What you would do after it afterwards is all the same. So. Now we're going to move on to this Salamander free tab. Um, so hopefully, if it's installed correctly, you should see you've got a huge mass of different uh, components up here, uh, which allow you to uh, create and define various things about the structural geometry. Um, and the component that we're going to use is this one here. Uh, which is in Salamander Free Tab in the model group. There is a component in there called Create Linear Element. Uh, so we're going to use this to create a 1D element, uh, essentially, um, which has got a line which defines its geometry, um, and then a section applied to it, which you know gives it the full 3D um, block geometry, which is actually the kind of analytical representation. Um, so. We'll create one of these. Uh, what this component has is three different inputs. First of all, L is the set out geometry of the element, so that can be the beam center line. 
Uh, so we'll plug our line in there. The second input there is the section that we want to give um, that uh, beam. Um, and in order to assign something there, we'll need to create uh, a section uh, that we can then uh, apply to that element. Um, and you can do this in lots of different ways from this sections group. Um, so if we wanted to, then we could, for example, set up a rectangular hollow section. Um, there's a component in there which will allow you to set one up manually um, by specifying the depth and width and flange thickness and web thickness and so on and so forth. Um, so we could set one up that way. Uh, what we can also do is use any of these components here, which look like sort of books, uh, in order to use uh, a catalog section. So we can pull from the sort of standard uh, library profiles. So that's what we'll do here. Um, I'll pull down one of these iProfiles catalog components. <coughs> um, and this just basically gives us a drop down, which lets us choose from catalog from various different types of standard beams, um, a beam that we might like, so I will choose one sort of in the mid-range around here. Um, so all of these different uh, catalog components let you choose um, let you choose section profiles from the catalog, um, although what this is actually giving you here is just a bit of text, it's just a string. So if I try and plug that straight in, uh, it's not going to work because we haven't actually turned that into a uh, a proper section property yet. Uh, so in, a, in order to actually turn this bit of text into a section, uh, we can use this component here, text to section. Um, if you drop one of those down, what that lets you do is give the section a name um, if you want to. Uh, we'll just leave that as it is, I think. D is the section description. Um, and if you're familiar with GSA at all, uh, this is kind of equivalent to the column in there in the, in the sections table, which gives the actual geometrical description of the beam. So if we plug um, our iProfiles uh, catalog uh, selector in there, that will then generate for us uh, a section um, based on that. Uh, and if we wanted to, we could specify a material in there. Uh, in this case, I'm not going to bother because it will default to steel anyway. Um, so we'll just leave that blank for now. Um, and then what this is outputting is, first of all, the section that it's created. Um, so Salamander creates uh, a bunch of essentially customized object types which you can use inside um, Grasshopper. Um, and one of those, uh, so there's several different new types that Salamander builds into Grasshopper, uh, which kind of have their own different rules. Uh, one of those is the section. Um, so we can take that S output, plug it into the S input of the create linear element um, component. And that will then extrude that section along that curve and give us out the other side another special type of object that Salamander adds in, which is a linear element. <coughs> um, the other thing that this component will give you uh, from the two other outputs is just some curves that describe the perimeter of that uh, section. So you can see it's drawn that uh, at the origin. Um, and if you were drawing a hollow section, uh, then your voids uh, would come out from the other input. Um, we don't really want to see that right now, so we can just close that up. Um, but that could be useful if you just wanted to actually be able to generate different section profiles, perhaps. Um, so if you were <coughs> doing something like we did uh, in Emily's session, where we were optimizing a section profile, uh, and you didn't want to have to actually go through and build up that section profile yourself, uh, you could just use one of these uh, eye section components or something like that in order to actually generate that profile as well. Um, but that's not what we need to do here. So we've now got a linear element that we've created. 
Um, so we've essentially defined all the geometry of our of our uh, model here. This is this is as far as we're going to go. It's not particularly advanced geometry, but um, it'll it'll demonstrate the principles. Um, and we can make that beam longer or shorter as we desire. So I'll make it a bit longer. Um, but what we've got to do now before we can actually spit this out to an analysis model that will run is to assign some other information to this um, in order to you know, give it some extra properties. Um, so first of all, uh, we need to define the restraint conditions on this beam. Um, so what we're going to do is to pin, uh, well, we're going to, Pin one end and fully restrain the other end just to keep it interesting. Um, so we can do that using this component here, restrain node. Um, so this is under salamander free model. <coughs> so we can use this to restrain a node, but uh, first of all, we need to actually get the nodes that we want to restrain. Um, so coming out of this component uh, is the element that we created. Uh, I think I might actually modify this so it also gives you the start and end node automatically. But uh, we can actually extract from that element the node at the start and the node at the end. Um, and we can do that using this component here, get nodes. Um, so one thing that Salamander does that uh, is a bit atypical um, in terms of what uh, you normally do inside Grasshopper. Grasshopper is typically value-based. Um, and what that means is when you pass stuff in and out of components, uh, even if no visible change has happened, uh, what's coming out at the end is actually a copy of what you put in at the start. Um, however, most structural analysis programs, uh, like uh, GSA, for example, uh, do not work this way. They are instead reference-based. Um, and what that means is if you see node 1 written somewhere in GSA, uh, two elements, for example, might both be connected to node 1. Um, and in order for that system to operate, node 1 there needs to be a consistent object. So that single node needs to be shared between two different um, elements. Um, and what that means is that that needs to actually be a consistent reference pointing to a single object. Um, so this is the way that Salamander actually works inside Grasshopper. Um, because of that, there are some weird things about it, um, just because of the way that that works, because it's not copying everything every time. Um, so it does mean, for example, that you can create an element um, and then assign a section to it later on using a different component, um, and that will actually change it on the original element as well, um, which is not the way that Grasshopper typically works, but you, know, you get used to it. Um, so if we use this get nodes component, uh, we can plug our element into E, and what this will give us is the nodes that it's automatically generated um, at the start and the end of that element. Um, so it's given us a list, node 1 and node 2. Uh, so node 1 will be at the start of the element, node 2 will be at the end. Um, so let's assume we want to assign different uh, different restraint conditions to each of these nodes, just to make things slightly interesting. Um, we can just pull out from this the start and the end. Um, so if I go to sets and I get the list item component, I can plug my list of nodes in there. Um, and then if I zoom in on this close enough, I will get these little plus symbols appearing. Uh, I can click on the one up here to get a minus one. Uh, and then what this will give me is the item at the start of that list, which will be our start node, and the item at the end of that list, which will be our end node. So I think, I think you've used this technique before. Um, so here we can just do it to pull out those nodes individually. Um, and if you have a whole bunch of different elements all together in a line and you want to just pull out the start and end uh, node, then you could do, do it this way as well. Um, so we can take that and plug that into the N input. Uh, but what this component is also expecting 
um, in a similar way to the equivalent in Karamba, um, is a fixity condition in there. Um, so what we need to give it here is essentially a set of booleans, set of true or false values, um, one each for the x, y, z, x, x, y, y, and z, z axes, um, so representing translational and rotational fixity. Um, so Salamander also creates, as well as elements and sections and nodes and so on, all these different types. Uh, there's also uh, a data type that it creates called ball 6 d uh, which is essentially just that set. It's essentially a vector of Booleans uh, with six dimensions. Um, and there's a component here, just called ball 6 d uh, which gives you a little control which lets you uh, toggle those things on or off. Um, so if I toggle on X, Y, and Z, that will essentially um, reply. That will essentially give us full translational restraint. Um, so if I plug that into there, that will essentially create a pin support at that end of the node. Uh, I'll just copy and paste that and use it for the node at the other end. Um, but at this end, I will fully restrain everything. Um, so we'll give that full uh, translational and moment fixity. Um, Um, and obviously, in the real world, you could set this up however uh, you wanted to. Um, so you could have, you know, uh, purely a Z support at one end as a fairly sort of a typical situation. Um, but we'll leave it as it is for now. <coughs> okay, so that gives us our node restraints. Um, so we could export that to GSA as it is now, and we'd have. Uh, something with a section and something with uh, some end uh, restraints. Um, but what we also want to be able to do is to add some loads onto this. So let's just give it a nice uniform, uniformly distributed load all the way along this beam. Uh, and we can do that using these loading uh, components. So if you go to that drop down, um, and you go to linear element load. This allows us to define um, a uniformly distributed load along uh, that beam or along any beam. Uh, so let's run through the inputs here. First of all, n is the name, so you can give that load a name uh, if you want to. Uh, the second input, c, is the case. Uh, so this defaults to live. Um, so if you wanted to, you could change the name of that case just by plugging a different string in here. Um, what's important is that if you're creating multiple loads which you all want to be in the same case, then just use a consistent name for each of those. Um, so if you wanted to create lots of different loads and have them all in a case called snow, for example, you just need to plug that name in there. Uh, a is the elements that this load will apply to. So into there, I will just plug the element we created earlier. And you should then hopefully see uh, kind of a symbol representing that UDL now all the way along that beam. Uh, v is the value of the load. Um, so I'm going to set up a slider to control this. Um, and to make things nice and easy for whoever's using this, uh, I'm going to set up that load in uh, kilonewtons. So first of all, uh, I'll create a load which is, let's say, 6 kilonewtons. Uh, and I've put in a dot and two zeros, so I get two decimal places. Um, so I'll rename that. UDL uh, and just to oops, UDL. 
And just to remind myself what the units are, I'll put in brackets kilonewtons per meter. Um, so I've now defined uh, a slider in terms of a UDL of kilonewtons per meter. Um, but one other thing you need to know about salamander is that units are important now. Um, and salamander components, by default, will use SI units. So they'll use meters, uh, unless Rhino is set to millimeters or something like that. Um, and it will use newtons for the values of loads. Uh, and also, um, loads will be defined uh, in the kind of standard coordinate system. So uh, if I want a load to be going down, then similar to what we did with Karamba last week, uh, you need to make that a negative number. Um, so, to do all that, uh, I'll use an expression component uh, from maths script expression. Um, so, I can zoom in here and I can click minus next to that y value because I don't actually want that. Um, and then I can plug in my slider. And then the equation that I'll put in here is minus x, because I want it to be going down instead of up, multiplied by 1,000, because I need to get it into newtons in order to plug it into this component here. And then once I've done that, I can plug that into v. And then I can control the value of that load using that slider. Um, so, you can use this to parametrically control loads. Um, you might also want to set up something which is a bit more complicated than this, um, where you, uh, for example, are creating this load based on um, the span between your beams. Um, so you could set it up to automatically generate that. Uh, I've been doing a bunch of stuff recently. Uh, where I've been taking wind tunnel test results and then mapping them onto um, a facade. So you could control the value of your loads um, based on that. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you could set this up in order to actually control uh, what value of load you're applying to these objects um, in a fairly uh, sort of straightforward way. Um, <coughs> final two inputs here we're not going to modify um, but they represent the direction um, of the load um, and the axes in which that uh, direction is um, specified um, and if you want to modify that at any point then back on the Salaman free tab uh, under params there are some drop downs similar to ball 6 ball 3d and so on uh, which will give you that. So you can specify a direction out of x, y, z, x, x, y, y, and z, z. And if you use any of these x, x, y, y, and z, z, then that will uh, effectively turn this into a moment. Um, and we could also uh, use a coordinate system reference. Uh, so we could choose between the global coordinate system or the local coordinate system of um, the beam. Um, for now, these have defaulted to Z and global, which is fine for what we're doing, so uh, I'm not going to bother with these here, but you can modify that if you want to. <coughs> okay, so I've now set up a very, very simple analysis model. Uh, no. Uh, well, it matters in the sense that uh, you need to set up this bar so that it is sensible. Um, but, uh, so if I was to change this to meters now, uh, then yes, it would matter because I'd end up with a beam which was uh, 7,456 meters long, uh, which would then be slightly problematic, I think, when it came to analyzing. For the loading, it's working in Newtons, yeah. So Rhino has no unit setting for... Um, has no unit setting for loads. Um, yeah, so in fact, this is actually always going to be in SI, so it's always going to be newtons per meter. Um, so yeah, if you were to 
change the units that it was in, then you should really adjust that slider, but you wouldn't need to adjust this one. Just, just to be confusing. Uh, so the section size is always, again, defined in SI units. So if you had one of these um, components here, then you would have to define that in uh, meters. Um, and it would always be in meters. Um, yeah, so any, anything, any distance or other value that you define in a, in a salamander component needs to be in SI units. Um, if you are creating geometry externally, like this curve, and then passing it in, then it will just use whatever units Rhino is using. So essentially, at this point here, it will automatically convert this geometry into SI units anyway for its own kind of internal representation. Um, okay, so we now got a full model. Uh, we can control the length of the beam. We can control the load on the beam. Uh, we can control the section on the beam. So I can have a great big beefy section if I want one, or I can have a slightly more uh, appropriate section for this kind of span and load. Um, <coughs> and I can control, yeah, so I can control the value of load, and I can also control the end restraints quite easily. Uh, so now let's finally export that out to GSA. Uh, and we can do that using this component over here, export GWA. Uh, so, there are several different export components over here. Uh, we're going to use GSA because hopefully that's what's installed on these machines. Um, you could also export to robot if uh, you hate yourself and want to use Autodesk software. <laughs> um, fortunately, I'm obliged to, by Rambo, use robot. Um, or eTabs if you want to do, well, gen generally eTabs is used, we use it more for kind of tool buildings and, and buildings and seismic areas because it's quite good for that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, GSA is quite nice as well. Uh, I guess I shouldn't technically say that because I don't work for RF anymore, so I shouldn't be, say, shouldn't be telling everyone how great their software is, but here we go. They can, they can have a freebie off me. Um, so what this component lets you do is to write out all this information uh, to GSA. Um, so the first input there is a write toggle. Um, so we need to put a boolean in there. Um, basically, it will write a file out when this is set to true, uh, and it won't write a file out when this is set to false. So you don't have to be constantly writing out um, new files every time something changes in your model, because that would be probably a pain in the bum. Uh, the next input there is the file path to write to. Um, so we need to find somewhere that I can save stuff to. Uh, can I just save it in this documents folder, do you think, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, actually, what I might do, if I can, to make it a bit easier, is write to this temp folder. So, uh, in here, what I will do is I will just create a panel, and in here I will type C colon backslash temp backslash um, and then I'll just call this uh, example dot GWA um, so writing out this file name is where things can go horribly wrong if you're not careful because um, you need to make sure that, you're, that this is a valid file name which is going to work um, and it can be quite particular about some of these things so um, hopefully this will work I guess we'll find out in a minute I might just save this just in case. As you can see, I have great faith in my own software. <coughs> um, so if I plug that into F, that will then give me a file name to write to. And if I set that toggle to true, it should write that file out now. Uh, and if I go to that temp folder, yes, there we are, it's written out. GWA file, and if I open that in GSA, uh, then what we should hopefully have is the loading on that. Uh, we should have the restraint conditions that we assigned. Uh, we should have, 
go on where the button is. Where's the button? There it is. We should have that section on there as well. Uh, and we should just be able then to hit analyze all and then have that analyzed for us. So we can look at the form shape, we can look at the moments, we can do everything else that we might want to do uh, inside uh, GSA. Um, so that's how we write out a file. Uh, the last input on here, T, uh, is the trigger. So if we want to automatically write out a file every time something is changed, um, and it's okay to do this generally for GSA, because in, in GSA's case, it's just writing out a text file, so it's pretty quick. Uh, in the case of eTabs and Robot, it's actually having to load up that software and open the API and then make lots of horrible slow API calls, so it takes friggin' ages. Um, so you probably don't want to do this in the case of those two particular bits of software. It's probably best to just you know write stuff out manually when you decide you want it. Um, but uh, what we can do using this final trigger input is just plug some stuff in there so that we automatically trigger um, a new update whenever ring changes. Um, so what I advise here, if you want to do this, is that you actually connect into here the end of every single chain of components that has salamander components in it. And the reason for that is um, we want this component to wait until all of those components have finished firing. Otherwise, uh, sometimes Grasshopper kind of does stuff in a slightly weird order that we can, maybe can't predict. Um, but it will always wait until everything that's connected to something has updated before it updates that thing. Um, so if we didn't do this uh, and we only triggered it off one thing, then that might trigger it writing out a file before it's finished updating everything else. And then you're writing out a file which has only got half of those updates made, if that makes sense. Um, so gen generally, it's to be on the safe side, it's good to just connect everything that you want to have happen before that file gets written out um, in there. Uh, and now what we can do is modify that length. And then if I go back to that temp folder and open up that file again, uh, that is now a much shorter beam. <coughs> um, and if you wanted to, then you could set this up so that uh, it was writing out a different file name every single time. So. I won't bother doing it here, but what you could do is just uh, concatenate a few strings together so that this was uh, C temp example and then the beam length and then millimeters and then dot GWA. Uh, and then every time you move this slider, it would spit out a new fresh um, analysis model. So you could spit out, you know, hundreds or thousands of different models if you wanted to and then uh, have a lot of fun going through and looking at them all. Um, so one last thing I'll show you before we move on to something else uh, is how you actually bake stuff. Um, so you can bake stuff the normal way. So if I wanted to actually get um, this element that we've created into uh, Salamander itself, then I could uh, bake that. That would then be uh, a model. That would then be an element uh, in Salamander that I could modify and change the properties of. So if I wanted to, I could modify the releases on one end of this, or whatever. Um, but the problem with doing that is then that's not going to update in the same way that other stuff doesn't. Uh, so if I delete that, the other way that I can bake stuff to Salamander, but also keep it linked to the Grasshopper model, is if you right click on any salamander component, there is a little toggle in there called modify main model. Uh, so you can check that and then rather than kind of writing to an imaginary model that sits inside Grasshopper, it will actually write to the model inside um, Rhino itself. So the kind of the main salamander hosted model. Uh, you can also use this component here, the salamander auto bake um, component. Uh, and this basically lets you toggle that with a boolean. So I'll use that one in this case. It's, it's affecting the same setting. Um, but now if I set that to be true, um, then 
when I make changes in here, it is automatically making those changes uh, in uh, the main model. Um, and importantly, what it's actually doing is Salamander is maintaining a record of what objects are created when. Um, and instead of creating new ones all the time, it's actually going to update those existing objects. So what that means is if you export something out, and in GSA it's element 2, um, it's going to stay element 2 and it's going to keep those links. Um, so you can make modifications to this element um, and those modifications may or may not be overwritten when you move stuff in here, but you can kind of switch between manually modeling stuff um, and uh, algorithmically modeling stuff uh, inside uh, Salamander. And if I toggle that to false now, I can make changes in here, which won't be automatically updated. But then as soon as I toggle that back to true again, those uh, will be applied to the main model. So you can essentially have two different uh, salamander models on the go at once, one which is inside Rhino, one which is inside Grasshopper, but you can sync the two uh, fairly easily. Um, and then once you've got it in um, Rhino, something that's a bit easier usually than setting up uh, these components is actually you can just save it out in any file format you want uh, using this button here. So I could save it to GSA or I could save it to eTabs or I could save it to Robot. Um, and like I say, the eTabs and Robots exporters are quite a bit slower because they're writing out actual uh, data directly into those bits of software. Uh, so that's probably the way I would do it. Um, and this also means that you could draw part of your structure manually um, and then parametrically model another part of your structure and have that all interact um, more or less seamlessly. Um, okay, so I think I've blabbed on enough now about uh, my own software. Um, so first thing I should mention is that other interoperability plugins are available. So I'm talking about Salamander because I wrote it. Um, but there are lots of other plugins available which allow you to import and export to various other packages. Um, actually, this is quite an old slide now, and actually those two bottom ones don't really exist anymore, so uh, forgive the old slide. But if you go on Food for Rhino, if you want to export to a particular um, bit of software, uh, then you can look around for that. So uh, Geometry Gym here, which is written by uh, a lovely guy called John Merchant, uh, that does some of the same sort of stuff that Salamander does for different packages, so that's quite good for writing to IFC and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, so you can do a search on there, um, and if you find that there isn't something available, um, then this comes on to the next thing we're going to look at, which is how you can extend uh, Rhino and Grasshopper your own way. So this is essentially kind of what I did when I built Salamander. Uh, we're not going to go quite into that level of detail. Um, but what I'm going to show you here is how you can actually write code inside Grasshopper and inside Rhino in order to extend the capabilities in an easy way. Um, so I'm not going to teach you everything you need to know about coding in the next hour or so. Uh, sorry. Um, but what I am going to do is just kind of get you started. So the trickiest thing about learning to code is actually kind of, OK, where do I start? Um, so I'm not going to be able to teach you everything about coding, um, but uh, I'll give you, you know, a, li a little push in the right direction and I'll, I'll show you um, where you can uh, start from. Um, so one thing uh, I often get asked uh, is what coding language is the best one to learn, um, and there is no real good answer to that. Uh, there are lots of different languages available. Um, and there's kind of a, a familial system there where lots of languages kind of split in two and, and turn into new languages or have sort of sequels built on uh, what was there already. Um, so inside Grasshopper, you've got three main options for scripting. Um, you've got C Sharp, you've got Visual Basic .NET, um, and you've got Iron Python, uh, although it's often referred to just as Python uh, in Rhino Grasshopper, it is in fact a special type of Python called Iron Python. Um, so these are 
three different languages which have kind of evolved in uh, in slightly different ways from different um, systems. So uh, VB.NET grows out of the family of Visual Basic languages. So VBA you might be familiar with if you've ever done any scripting inside Excel or something like that. So that's the main thing um, that gets used in Excel. Um, there's also an offshoot of that called RhinoScript, uh, which uh, you don't really need to use anymore, but um, you can use that to script inside Rhino. So before Grasshopper existed, uh, that's what we were all using uh, back in the good old days, uh, was RhinoScript in order to kind of automate stuff and, and generate uh, models uh, inside um, Rhino. So that was, that was, that was where I started. Uh, don't really ever need to use it anymore, but you can if you want to. Um, so of these languages, uh, so I've actually written stuff in all of these. Uh, the one that I kind of settled on as my personal favorite, uh, or at least the most widely useful one that I tend to use is C Sharp. So that's what we're going to look at today. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best language for all purposes. Um, but it's a good kind of mid-range language. So Python is actually a lot easier and faster to write stuff in sometimes, but it's a little bit more limited in what you can do with it because it's kind of designed as a scripting language. Uh, whereas at the other extreme, you've got stuff like C++, which is super fast and super efficient, um, but it expects you to do a lot of the kind of heavy lifting yourself. Um, so C Sharp is quite a nice sort of mid-range language. Um, and VB.NET is essentially the same as C-sharp, just with different syntax. Um, so either one of those is quite a nice uh, language to choose, uh, or of course Python itself, uh, depending on what you want to do. Um, but in this example, we'll look at C-sharp. Um, so as I mentioned, you can script stuff inside Rhino. Uh, so there is a Rhino script editor, which Again, because it's based on VBA, is very, very similar to the code editor that you might know inside Excel. Uh, so if you've done scripting in Excel, then this might be something uh, to look at. Like I say, it's been kind of made a bit obsolete by, um, by Grasshopper now, so I don't tend to use it much myself, but it is there. Um, there's also Python, uh, I think, I'm not sure if that's built in or whether it's a plugin, but um, there's also uh, Python that you can use uh, inside Rhino itself. Um, but what we're going to be looking at uh, is to script inside um, Rhino and well, inside Grasshopper itself. Um, so I'll show you how you can write your own components um, in order to extend the functionality of uh, Grasshopper. So uh, you can save that example if you want. And then let's open a new document. Uh, and I will blank my salamander model, so that's not going to bother us anymore. So, um, we're going to start by writing a very simple script, which is just going to multiply two numbers together. Um, so if you go to the Maths tab in the script group, um, there is a component in there called C Sharp Script. Uh, there's also a VB script component. Um, so you can also get a plugin which allows you to write Python in a very similar way to what I'm about to show you. Um, so if you have that plugin installed, it's a, it's a plugin that actually McNeil themselves write. So uh, I think it might actually be in the, the most modern version of Grasshopper itself. Um, but that will also appear in here. Um, so if we drop down a C Sharp script component, this essentially gives us um, a component that we can fully customize. So we can change the inputs and outputs of this. Um, we can uh, modify what is actually going on inside it. Um, we can basically do uh, more or less whatever we want with this component. Um, so, like I said, we're going to use this to multiply two numbers together. Uh, so I'll create some number sliders, so I have one set to four and one set to six, for example. And I'll plug those into X and Y. Uh, 
Um, so we've got a lot of control over these inputs. We can add new ones if we want to. We can take them away. Um, what we can also do is specify the type of data um, that this input is expecting. Um, so if you right click on the input, uh, then you get a bunch of options um, down the bottom here for uh, how that parameter is set up. And if you go to type hint, you can change the type of data that that uh, object is expecting. So in this case, we're going to multiply two numbers together. Um, and there are several actual different types of number, um, which you may have come across actually using uh, Grasshopper itself. Um, so in this case, they're referred to here as int, which is short for integer, i.e. whole numbers, um, and double, uh, which is short for double precision floating point number. Um, which is actually a more generally useful uh, form of number. It's, it's essentially just uh, any number that you want to have with any number of decimal places up to the memory limits of the operating system. So you can't quite have anything in there, but uh, you can have quite a lot. So uh, on each of these inputs, uh, select double. So on X and Y, go to type in, set that to double. So what we'll do in this component is we'll multiply x by y and we'll spit out the answer to a. Um, we could, if we wanted to, actually change the names of these. Um, I'm not going to bother in this case. We'll do that on the next one. Um, but once you've set that up, if you then double click on that component, it will come up with a script editor which allows you to modify what's going on uh, inside here. <coughs> um, so there's a bunch of boilerplate code in here uh, that it sets up for you um, and you don't really need to worry about that. Uh, you can't actually modify it anyway. Um, all you can modify is what is in uh, these two blank white lines in here. Um, but what it's set up is what is called a function definition. Um, so a function definition has a name and it's got a set of parameters which are going to be used in that function. So a function is basically a little chunk of code um, that has inputs and outputs. So it's essentially a kind of a, a component uh, in and of itself. Um, and what this tells us here is that we've, or it has specified a function for us called run script. Um, and the inputs here are double x, uh, which is our input that we set up, uh, double y, and uh, ref object a. So we can use x and y as our inputs, a is going to be our output. So, uh, let me zoom in so this is nice and big. So, it's traditional when learning a new programming language that the first thing you ever do in it is write hello world. So, let's do that. Um, so, what we're going to do first of all uh, is just write a line of code which is going to um, put out, outside this component, um, the bit of text, hello world. Uh, so to do that, uh, we are going to use a function that, that's built into this component. So this function here called run script is a function. Um, we're going to use a function which is actually defined up here if you want to go and have a look at it, called print. Um, and we can use that by typing in the word print. Um, so C sharp is capital sensitive, so make sure you include the capital P. Um, and then to pass information into that function, uh, what we need to do is to put an open bracket. Um, we then need to put in um, the bit of data that we're going to pass into that function. So this function is going to take that bit of data, it's going to do something with it. Um, 
And as we're typing out, we'll get these little hints popping up. Um, so what this is telling us is that this wants an input which is of a type called string, which is basically just a fancy word for uh, bits of text. Uh, and it wants to be called text. Um, so that's just telling us what the name of it is. And below that, uh, it will give us oops, uh, a little hint as what it wants. So it says text, so that's the name of the variable, string to print. So in here, we can just type a bit of text, but we have to do it inside quotation marks. Um, so quotation marks tell uh, the code that we are just using uh, this next. So the, the bit in between the quotation marks is going to be treated as a bit of text rather than uh, another set of commands in the code. So in here, I'll write, hello world. You can write anything you want instead. Hello world is traditional. <coughs> um, so make sure that what you've got in there is between uh, these little double quotation marks. That will just tell it that it's a bit of text. Um, and then finally, close off that bracket that we opened over here. Um, and then the final thing is very important inside C Sharp. So this is a C Sharp specific thing. Um, some other languages don't do it. Is we need to put on the end a semicolon. So each individual instruction you write in C Sharp um, has to have a semicolon on the end um, in order to kind of close off that instruction. It's kind of the full stop of C Sharp, basically. <coughs> uh, so now if we hit OK, and we look at this out output, if we plug a panel into that, uh, we can now see that that says hello world. So whenever we print something uh, in one of these components, it will get spat out from this out uh, output. Um, and this is actually quite useful. Uh, we can use this, uh, especially when we're debugging uh, what we've written and making sure it's working okay, we can use this to output a bit of textual information. Um, so, you know, we can kind of report the steps that the script is doing as it does it um, out here. Um, so if we double click again, we can go back into the code. Um, so the next thing that we're going to do is to um, assign something. So what we want to do is to multiply x and y together. And then we're going to assign the value of that calculation to our output A. Um, so to do that, we can write it essentially in the form of an equation. And we can say A equals X, and then uh, asterisk, which is how you write multiplication in this, X times Y, and then remember to put a semicolon in the end. Um, and again, it's uh, capital sensitive, so uh, A needs to be capitalized, X and Y can be lowercase. And then if we hit OK, and then if we plug a panel into A, then hopefully that should now give us whatever the result of those two numbers being multiplied together is. So congratulations, you've all written your first program, unless you've written lots of programs before, in which case, good for you. Um, so we've now got a functional specialized component uh, that we have written ourselves um, in order to multiply two numbers together. Um, so this gives us another way of setting up um, mathematical equations and things like that um, in a way that gives us even more control and power um, than these uh, evaluate and expression components. But we can also write code that deals with geometry. Um, so what we'll do next is we will write our own component um, that essentially replicates the very first thing that we did um, back when we started uh, learning Grasshopper, which was to draw a line between two points. Um, so 
what we'll do is we will write a component that does that, um, and then we will uh, see what else we can do. So we'll see if we can go beyond um, what that component does. Um, so first of all, pull down another C# -sharp script component, um, and then we'll specify two points. So if you pull down two more param components, uh, I'll create two points in Rhino, and then right-click, set one point, right-click, set one point. It's like we're all the way back at the start. So plug those into X and Y, but let's not actually keep calling these X and Y, let's give them a more descriptive name. So if you right-click on that input, on the X input, then up the top we can actually change the name of that input. Um, so I'm going to call this first input here PTA. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll go down to the type hint and I will set the type to 0.3D. So this is this is quite important, this bit. So make sure you set the type hint to 0.3D. Uh, and then do the same thing for the second one. We'll call that PTB. Uh, it's important that they have different names. Um, and we will set the type of that to be 0.3D as well. Um, and then this output here, uh, let's rename that. So right click on that and then we'll change that to line. So once you've set that up, if you double click on that component and then look at this run script function that it's set up for you, uh, what you should now see is that the types and the names of these inputs have now changed. Um, so now our parameters, which are part of this function, are called 0.3D PTA. So 0.3D is the type of data, PTA is the name, 0.3D PTB and then ref object line will be our output. Um, so things like points and lines and so on um, are slightly more complicated than just the numbers that we used in the last example. Um, so these are things called objects. Um, and objects are kind of composites of different bits of data. Um, and they have uh, essentially uh, different variables that kind of sit inside um, that variable. So, for example, if I was to type in PTA and then put a dot, I can see all of the various different um, bits of data that belong to um, that uh, point type, point 3D type. Um, so, these little things with the purple box next to them are functions. So these are bits of code which are kind of attached to that object um, and can be run to manipulate that. Uh, these things with the little white box next to it are properties. Um, so in this case, we've got the x, y, and z coordinate of that point um, as properties. Um, so one thing that's important about objects is that they have uh, multiple bits of kind of sub data uh, which can be contained within them, and that sub data itself can be other objects, and you can have you know quite a complex hierarchy there. Um, the other thing to know about objects, well, there's actually thousands of things to know about objects, but um, the second one that we'll cover here is that um, you need to um, create them in a special way. Um, so what we'll do here is create. Um, a new line object um, and actually I've just realized I've called this line that's a terrible thing to do because that's actually the name of a type so let me go out here and change that to be line with a lowercase l this is actually quite important um, so make sure you specify that okay 
And now what I'm going to do is for our uh, variable line, which is our output variable, I'm going to create a new line um, to go in there. And we can create new objects in code uh, using the keyword new. So first of all, type in new. Then you type in the type of object you want to create. So in this case, I'm going to create a new line. Uh, so line with a capital L is a particular data type uh, in here. Uh, line with a lowercase l is our variable name. So like I say, it's case sensitive. So make sure you don't mix them up. Um, and then when you create a new object, you can essentially pass in um, some data as if it was a function. Um, and it will use the data that you pass in when it's creating that object. Um, and different object types will have different uh, functions set up to allow you to create them. Um, in this case, if I type in new line and then I put an open bracket, I will get in uh, a couple of different hints if I flip through these buttons, so, which give me different ways of creating a line, basically. Um, so I can specify the x, y, and z coordinates of the two ends of that line manually if I want to. Um, I can specify a start point and then a vector which tells it the direction of the line and the span of it. Uh, I can give it a start point, a direction vector, and a length, so that it will then create a line which is that long in that direction. Uh, or I can just use the default one, which is what I'm going to do, uh, which lets me specify two points, one point from, one point to. Um, so in here, I will type in new line PTA, PTB, um, close brackets, and then make sure you put the semicolon on. So that is the line of code that will create a new line between point A and point B. So if I now hit OK, we should now see we have a lovely straight line between those two points. So, so far so good. Um, we have basically replicated the functionality that's built into Grasshopper anyway. Um, big whoop. But what we can do with this is actually go a few steps further, and we can actually build much more complicated scripts um, that have a bit of built-in intelligence or can do stuff that uh, Grasshopper itself can't do. So Grasshopper it's itself, uh, debatably, uh, is itself a programming language. Uh, so it's a programming language where you use diagrams instead of text, um, so there's some uh, debate about whether or not that actually counts or not. Personally, I think it counts. Um, so Grasshopper itself is a programming language, um, but it is slightly limited in what you can do. Um, by scripting inside it, though, um, you can actually overcome the limitations of that, um, and you can start to create components uh, which can do things that you couldn't do very easily um, just using uh, the beat the default built-in components. Uh, so what I'm going to do actually is I'll copy and paste that. Uh, you don't have to. If you don't want to, you could just get rid of this or reuse it. Um, and what I'm going to do now is actually extend this component um, so that it has got a bit of intelligence built in and it can make a decision um, based on the inputs you give it. Um, so instead of giving it two points now, uh, what I'm going to do is give it three points. Um, so bring in another param component, so another point param component, um, and select a new point in Rhino. What I'm going to give this component now is three points, point A, point B, point C. Um, and what I'm going to get it to do is to make a choice about where it's going to draw that line. Um, and that choice is going to be based on distance. So what it's going to do is it is going to draw a line between point A and whichever of point B or C 
is the closest one. So if point B is closest, it will draw a line to that. If it, point C is closest, it will draw a line to that. Um, so first things first, I need to pull uh, a new uh, input into this. And if I zoom in on that component, I'll get up these little pluses and minuses. Uh, so by clicking on the plus at the bottom, I can create a new input. And I can create as many inputs or as many outputs as I want. <coughs> uh, so I will right click, I'll call this new input PTC. Um, and I will set the type hint to point 3D, as I did with the other ones. Um, and then I'll plug my third point in there. So make sure it's called PTC or something that you're going to remember. Uh, and set the type hint to point 3D. Um, and the reason that we need to set this type in instantly is that when we actually bring this into the code, the type of an object limits what we can do with it. So if we tell uh, the C sharp component that what we're giving it is a point, then it will know to treat it as a point and we'll be able to do stuff with that point, like pull out its XYZ coordinates and all the things which are specific to that type of object. Um, so yeah, just make sure that's in there. Okay, so now things get a bit more interesting. So we're going beyond just a single line of code here. Um, so what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the distance um, between point A and point B. Um, and in fact, what I'm going to do here is write out uh, what we're going to do uh, in the form of comments. Um, so if you want to write a comment um, in C sharp, then you do that with two forward slashes at the start of a line. Then anything you write after those two forward slashes uh, is a comment, so it's there purely for our benefit. When the computer is processing the code, it's just going to ignore that line, it's not going to do anything with it. So, um, so I'm going to use some comments here to just write out what we're going to do. Uh, so first of all, we're going to calculate the distance A to B. Uh, then we're going to calculate the distance A to C. Then what we'll do, if A to B, or if A is closer to B than A, oops, than C, sorry, it's been a long day, uh, then draw a line from A to B. Otherwise, draw a line from A to C. Um, so this in English is what we're going to do. Uh, all we need to actually do is now translate this uh, into a form that the computer can understand. Um, so first of all, we're going to want to calculate uh, the distance A to B. Um, so we're going to calculate that and we're going to store it in a new variable. Um, so if I want to create a new variable, so so far we've just been using the variables that we've defined outside this object um, and that we're passing in uh, to this function. Um, but we can define temporary variables inside uh, this bit of code if we want to. Um, so we can use this just to store bits of information um, as we're going. Uh, so I'm going to store a number here. Um, and I want it to be a floating point number, so any kind of number at all. Um, and that means that I want to use the type double that we used before when we're multiplying those two numbers together. Um, so what I need to do here is declare a variable um, by first of all typing double. So double is the type of the variable um, that we're going to declare here. Um, and technically, we don't have to specify what this is. We could instead use the keyword var, short for variable, um, and then we can. it will kind of work out what type it needs to be for itself. But um, for now, let's uh, keep it simple and just specify that type. Um, and I will call this variable 
distance a to b. Um, so I can call this variable whatever I want, um, but uh, it's case sensitive. Uh, I can't put spaces in it. Um, I can't start it with a number. Uh, there are a few other different rules about how you can uh, name variables. Um, but generally, we can just give it a name which is fairly descriptive. Um, so what this tells the computer is that we want to create a little box in memory uh, which is going to hold a number, so double type. Um, and we're going to call that little box distance A to B. So we're going to stick some data in that box, and then later on we're going to go to that box and pull some data out again. Um, so what we need to give it now, uh, or what we can give it now, is the data that we want to store in there. Um, and the data that we want to store in there is the distance from point A to point B. So we need to work that out. Um, so we can get from these points their x, y, and z coordinates. So we could just use uh, Pythagoras's theorem here. We could work out uh, the square root of the difference between uh, the x coordinate squared and the y coordinate squared and the z coordinate squared. Um, we could do that uh, if we wanted to write a big long equation. Uh, otherwise, there is a function built into that point type uh, called distance 2. Um, and what that will do is it will find the distance from the point that we're calling it on to another point that we give it. So if we type in PTA dot distance 2, um, and then if we open the brackets and we then give it the other point that we want to measure the distance to, so in this case PTB, um, and then end that with a semicolon, what this line tells it to do is to calculate the distance between point A and point B and then store it in this variable called distance A to B. So that will store that distance. We now need to do that same thing um, for our next one. So we'll say distance A to C is our other variable name. And we'll just then say in there PTA dot distance to PTC. So it's exactly the same line. Let me make that a lot bigger so you can actually see it. So it's exactly the same line. It's just we've basically replaced the Bs with Cs. Um, so we've calculated those two distances now. And now what we need to do is to let the code make a decision based on those variables, based on those values. Um, so what we want to say to the computer is, if distance A to B is lower than distance A to C, then do something, otherwise do something else. Um, and we can tell the computer exactly this, but we have to do it uh, in essentially the correct format. Um, so what we're going to do here is use something called an if statement, uh, which is a logical construction in code. Um, and what that basically lets us do is to specify a condition. Um, and if that condition is true, then we'll do one thing. If the condition is false, then we can tell it to do something else. Um, so the syntax to define that is, first of all, if, uh, all lowercase. Um, and then the condition that we want to check uh, we put in um, round brackets. So what we want to put in here is if distance A to B. Um, so what we're doing here is we are telling it to go and fetch the value that is stored in that variable. Um, so what's important here is that we spell the variable name correctly um, so that it knows what we're referencing. Uh, so if distance A to B, and then if we put in uh, a kind of angle bracket, um, a less than sign, so we can say if distance A to B is less than distance A to C, 
Um, so that is the condition we want to check. Um, so we can close that in brackets. And what the code will do is it will um, look at that condition. It will evaluate it as either true or false. Um, and if it's true, um, then it will execute the following block of code. Uh, so to specify a block of code, uh, we have to use these little curly brackets in here. Um, so we can use this in C-sharp to denote, essentially, a section of code um, which uh, is sort of semi-separate from that which surrounds it. So below that line where we've written if brackets distance a to b is lower than distance a to c, close brackets, if we put in some curly brackets in there, then whatever we write between um, those curly brackets uh, is the actions that this is going to perform uh, if that condition is true. Um, so in here now, if we write in, oops. So if distance A to B is less than distance A to C, we want to create a line between uh, A and B. So in here, we can write the same line that we wrote uh, before. Line equals new line PTA PTB. Um, so when you're writing code in Grasshopper, uh, it can all go horribly wrong if you're not careful. Um, so it's useful, as soon as you've done anything which is going to produce an output, um, it's useful just to check that it's working. Uh, so Oh, what I should also do is actually turn off the preview of what I had previously. Otherwise, that's just I'll delete that. Uh, otherwise, it will get in the way. <coughs> so what we can now do? Oops. Oh dear. This has all gone horribly wrong. Which of these points is which? Okay, so that's my point A. That's my point B. That's my point C. So if I take point B and I move it so that it's closer to point A than point C is it should now start drawing a line between those two things. If I move it so that it's further away, then that line will not be drawn. And because I'm now in 3D, and this has all gone horribly wrong, let's go into top view. What have I done? Let's project all these to the seaplane. <laughs> Now it's all flat and we can tell what's actually going on. So if I move that point closer to point A, it will get a line drawn to it. Otherwise, it won't. Um, so hopefully that is what you're all seeing. Um, and just to finish this off, what we can also do is tell it what to do uh, if uh, that condition isn't true. Um, and we can do that by saying, oops, let me zoom in so you can see this a bit better. What we can then do below that bit of um, code, below the kind of closing curly bracket there, we can write else, and then another pair of curly brackets. And in here we can write line equals new line PTA to PTC. So basically what this does is it runs through its shopping list here. Um, it says, OK, we'll work out the distance A to B. We'll work out the distance A to C. At this point, it says, OK, if distance A to B is less than distance A to C, then we will execute this block of code here. Otherwise, this block of code here between these curly brackets will get ignored. Um, then what it's doing is it's saying, if that condition is false, then we'll run this block of code. Otherwise, we won't do anything. We'll just ignore that bit of code as well. So if I hit OK now, what we can hopefully see is that it is now essentially snapping between point A and whichever is the closest um, of point B or C. Um, so, like I said, uh, this is only a very, very basic introduction. Um, I'll throw the code back up there if you want to just make sure that what you've got is working. 
this is only a very very basic introduction uh, there's obviously a lot more to it than this um, but um, this is essentially it's not that much more complicated than this um, you need to be able to explain to the computer what you want it to be able to do and you need to learn the way in which it expects you to tell you that um, but otherwise um, it's largely a case of just um, telling the computer line by line um, step by step what you want it to do um, and by doing that you can open up some new possibilities that uh, you couldn't do just in ordinary grasshopper or you could do but which would be quite difficult um, so this is one example here where we can um, give it a bit of intelligence um, if we wanted to do an if statement without doing this then we would probably have to um, set up a condition uh, using uh, some of these masking so we could work out the distance between two points and we could do um, you know one of these smaller thans uh, and then we could use a dispatch component so that if that was true then it would take some objects and do something with them or if it was false it would do something else so you can kind of fake uh, if statements in uh, Grasshopper but it's a bit more complicated and a bit more unwieldy um, there are also a few things which it's even harder to do uh, so if I present again um, so this is how you script inside uh, Grasshopper itself um, this gives you some extra capabilities um, so, as well as uh, being able to um, make, cause it to make decisions by itself, uh, what you can also do is run processes which are a lot more iterative. Um, so, this is an example here uh, of a recursive algorithm. Um, and a recursive algorithm is essentially an algorithm that... Uh, runs on a bit of input data um, it will generate some outputs from that and then it will run that same algorithm on the outputs of that data so the outputs of, of the first process will become the inputs for the next process and it will run that same uh, algorithm again and it can do that over and over and over again um, and this is one way uh, of creating fractal images um, so in this example here uh, these are fractal branching structures um, and it's basically formed by taking a stick um, and sprouting two sticks uh, off of that stick at a particular set of angles. Um, what it's then doing is it's taking each of those sticks and it's sprouting two branches off of those sticks and then for each of those it's taking that and doing that. Um, so by doing that same simple operation over and over again uh, you can generate uh, these fairly pretty uh, fractal forms um, and there's a lot of uh, different fractals based on different algorithms um, that you can create and this would be pretty much impossible well in fact this would be impossible to do in basic grasshopper without either a copying or pasting a lot of components uh, or using a plugin like hoop snake or something like that which lets you kind of iterate uh, inside grasshopper so there are some plugins which uh, can help you do stuff like this but uh, it's often uh, easier to do it in code if you know how. Um, you can also set up um, algorithms which are iterative um, and sort of rely on differences in starting positions. Um, so what this uh, example here does is it essentially runs a particle simulation. Um, so uh, it sets up a bunch of little particles, little points. Um, those little points have a position in space, they have a velocity, um, and they have a gravatic pull on one another. Um, so what this is showing is uh, the starting position of those points. Uh, they're then moving along their own velocities. They're being kind of pulled together. Um, and as they're pulled together, they start to kind of orbit each other um, and uh, loop around each other. Um, so you could do this kind of thing with kangaroo. So this is essentially a physics simulation of gravity. Um, and you could do this kind of thing with kangaroo. Um, but 
by writing your own code to do it, you actually get an awful lot more control over what's going on there. So um, Kangaroo gives you a lot more options to do this kind of simulation, um, but writing it in code gives you even more options. You can set up uh, any kind of simulation of any kind of conditions you want. Um, and finally, if you want to go whole hog, uh, as I did with Salamander, you can actually, uh, rather than scripting inside Grasshopper itself, you can uh, write code in uh, a development environment like Visual Studio or something like that. Um, and then you can compile code to um, plugins for either Rhino uh, or Grasshopper. Um, so uh, for those of you who do have some experience with coding, and who know what a DLL is. Uh, a DLL is basically a library of code. Um, and RHP files and GHA files are basically just DLLs, uh, which have their name changed. Um, so they're just libraries of code with a different extension um, that uh, Rhino or Grasshopper know to kind of load up um, and run for themselves. Um, and with that, uh, you can really, in this case, do anything. You're no longer limited by um, Grasshopper or Rhino, you can create your own user interfaces, you can uh, link it up to anything else you want. Uh, the world is essentially your oyster once you know how to do this. Um, <coughs> so obviously we don't have time to cover all that today, but um, hopefully I've given you, you know, the kind of first stepping stone in uh, learning how to do that if you're interested or if you already know how to code. Um, I've hopefully shown you how to apply that uh, in the Grasshopper environment. Um, so that is the end of the session today, uh, and it's the end of the course as a whole. Uh, so you now know everything uh, about Rhino and Grasshopper, so well done. <laughs> um, so we've gone in this session from hello world to goodbye world, um, and uh, yeah, I'll See you around. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, about uh, Grasshopper or Rhino or anything in general, then uh, now is a good time to ask.